Welcome to Headliners of Service, our virtual speakers series presented by the Global Service Institute at Long Island University. Featuring engaging conversations with exceptional leaders from all walks of life. These inspiring, timely, and fascinating discussions are hosted by Emmy-winning journalist Rita Cosby, the chair of the Global Service Institute. Today's headliner is Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, the former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland and daughter of Robert F. Kennedy. During this presentation, we invite all of you to ask questions in the Q&A box, and we will have our guest answer as many as possible later in the program. You can also email them right now to questions at globalserviceinstitute.org. Everyone, please welcome Rita Cosby. And hello, everybody. I'm Rita Cosby, and welcome to our Headliners of Service speaker series hosted by the Global Service Institute at Long Island University. Our guest today is Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, who is an extraordinary public servant and obviously comes from one of the most prominent and most service oriented families in American history. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, so wonderful to have you here on this great Headliners of Service. Thank you, Rita. Well, it's good to be with you because you care deeply about service and you get people's stories across and I'm so impressed to be with you. And happy. Oh, oh, and so happy to be with you. Um, you know, we were talking, you and I got to share the Ellis Island Medal of Honor together, a very special night. Uh, it was also Siegfried and Roy and Tom Ridge and so many yeah. people. Yeah, it was great. And, and obviously it was wonderful to be at Ellis Island, a place that welcomed so many immigrants, which is really what it's helped to make our country great. You know, my, my uncle's um, President Kennedy actually wrote a book called A Nation of Immigrants, which is good Absolutely. to remember today when so many immigrants are coming to the United States and face such challenge to get here. Absolutely, for sure. And, and that was such a, a magnificent place. And as you talk about such a historic place, um, speaking of history, you were born on the 4th of July. And boy, are you a patriot. Uh, did, did you realize uh, just at a very early age, you've got to be grateful to this country, you know? I, well, um, I think I have to be grateful to my mother. My mother has a great sense of timing and uh, she wanted to make sure the first Kennedy grandchild would be born on the 4th of July. I think I was very late and she, she, she was made sure that I was born on the 4th of July. And then I have to tell you, um, my my brother, Christopher, um, who was the eighth child in our family, you know, we had 11, my, my, my parents had 11 children, was also born on the 4th of July. Um, and she wanted him to be born on the 4th of July. I have to tell you the story. So she played six sets of tennis that day. And then it was on in 1963. So my, my uncle was president, my father was attorney general and they arrived at, on a helicopter in Hyannisport and my mother at that point had gone into labor. And so she, she asked if she could get on the helicopter to go to um, Boston. And the helicopter, um, people who ran the helicopter did not know how to get to Boston. So they recruited my uncle Teddy, who is at that point Senator from Massachusetts to get on the helicopter and to direct them how to get up to Boston. Oh, yeah. but made it in time. <laughs> made it in time before midnight. Uh, they landed at, at the um, Harvard football stadium because he knew how to get to the Harvard football stadium and then got into a car to drive to the hospital so that mommy could deliver the baby. So you what can see mommy's story. set of timing is really quite extraordinary to have two children born on the 4th of July. That's amazing. And the other thing too, uh, Kathleen, is your mom also had just uh, just a joyous heart. And I think there's one story, and I have to ask you about this, that I read that your mom loved Gene Kelly so much. And is yes. it true that your dad surprised her on her birthday with the actual Gene Kelly in what yes. a bow and, and uh, yes. hiding in the closet? Tell us about yes. that. Uh, yes, my, my mother usually, you may know this, but sometimes even though you're married to one man, you might have a crush on somebody else. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't admit that, but that it happens to be true. 
And my mother, for some reason, liked Gene Kelly. I don't know if you ever seen the movie Singing in the Rain, but he's very attractive in that movie. And so um, my father realized that and not being a jealous husband, um, got Gene Kelly to come to our house and asked him to go in the basement where he very kindly did, got him wrapped up in red ribbon and then presented him to mommy as a birthday present. What a great birthday present, right? What a great birthday. Now, did she dance with him? Did, did something happen? Absolutely. <laughs> They, they danced till late in the night. My father would always, my mother loved to have parties and loved to dance. My father would always go to bed at 11 o'clock because he, you know, he had to get up in the morning and work. My mother would stay up and have a good time. How fantastic. How joyous was it in the household? Because here it is, your father, you know, Robert F. Kennedy, your mother, Ethel Kennedy, 11 kids. You were one of 11, uh, the eldest of the kids. How crazy was it in the household growing up? Well, there were, there's a, it was a mixture. Um, I mean, my mother, my mother was very strict about, you know, we would have dinner at, for the little kids at six and for the bigger kids at 6.30 because she thought she should divide the, the tables because table time for dinner because everybody should have an opportunity to talk. Um, but there was also a lot of other stuff going on. There were a lot of dogs and horses and reptiles snakes, armadillos, Cotamundi lizards. One, one time a Cotamundi lizard bit my mother, um, which was a very scary thing yeah. on her thigh when she was pregnant. Anyway, I, I wouldn't re recommend having a Cotamundi lizard in your house, just in <laughs> case you wanted to have one. But one of the really wonderful stories about my mother, when my father was the attorney general, we were riding next to the CIA and there were, what I guess the, the CIA would call secret houses mm -hmm. to keep people, you know, to help people out there. And in one of those houses, there was a man who was torturing and starving horses. Mm -hmm. And so my mother thought this was terrible as it was. So she asked um, somebody who worked for us to get the horses out of the, the stable and bring them home to our house. So the man was upset that the horses had been taken out of his stable and he sued her. And you have to know that was at that time, that was in Virginia and taking stealing horses was a hanging offense. So you've got my father, the attorney general and his wife is accused of stealing horses, which is a hanging offense. And I'm a <laughs> child. So you have two types of things going on. <laughs> and of course, my father found a very good attorney for my mother mm -hmm. and he got her off. But for about three months, there were the headlines of the attorney general's wife stealing horses. Of course, she had a very good defense, which was the man was stealing. It was starving the horses. Right. And that was and that's what got her. Off. I mean, so and, and it was good. She was really saving their lives. Right. But you can see. Fun. She's, she's very zippy. And when she sees something wrong, she tries to write it. Um, you talked about also um, events at the, at the table. One of the things that your father, RFK, would always say, talk about current events. I want you to talk about the stories of the day and bring it. You actually had sort of almost like a school assignment every yes. day at the dinner table. Yeah, at the dinner table, we were expected to, to reach to recite current events. And of, of course it was very important where you sat at the dinner table because if you sat at my mother's, my mother's right, you only had to know the front page, but as you went around the table and we had guests, you really had to know what was going on. And my mother, and we also had current events every night. And then on Sundays we had to discuss an important person in history and recite a poem. So there was a, it wasn't exactly a relaxing dinner table. <laughs> and my mother, of course, thought the idea of reciting current events was so important that when she drove the carpool, she expected everybody in the carpool to recite current events. And you could hear the other members of our carpool saying, oh, no, what happened today? Mrs. Kennedy is driving. And so that was interesting. And it's so different because when I drove the carpool with my children, I was not allowed to talk to the other kids in the carpool there's just I don't know if you've ever maybe in New York you don't drive carpools you probably don't but if you live in the, if you live in the suburbs you do anyway it's just a very different kind of 
culture. But yeah, I think the world's very, changed. <laughs> there was so much going on. It's just interesting about the, the discussion today on the filibuster, because my father, um, this was true at that time, they were trying to get the, 19, the civil rights law passed, mm -hmm. 1964 mm -hmm. civil rights, which they had started actually in 63. And the, the problem then was the Democratic Southern senators who clearly didn't want to get the civil rights law passed over and they were gonna filibuster it. And, and again, the same issue is coming up right now, the filibuster, which has been in my consciousness since the early sixties. And I just find it fascinating that the same fight is over and over and over again. Yeah, it is amazing. And to think about also what your father and also your yeah. uncle, just as some of the movements and the, and the path that they created also, yeah. um, you know, in terms of the, yeah. the discussion about the civil rights law, the discussion about so many of the issues that are forefront and actually, today. And the discussion about immigration. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, ch my father, and my uncle, as you, I told you, my uncle, John Kennedy, um, wrote a book called The Nation of Immigrants. Mm -hmm. And until the immigration law, which eventually was signed by President Johnson, really the most immigrants came from Europe. And they changed the law to say, we, we can have immigrants from Asia and immigrants from Africa. When we were growing up, and I'm sure that you're, I'm older than you, but we didn't have immigrants from you know, Indonesia or from Nigeria or from India in the way that we have them today. They were from Europe and that immigration law allowed a much more diverse America. And it's been a total boon to our life and our economy and to our understanding of the world. If we're gonna be a world power, which we want, you know, which I think America wants to be, it's great to have people from all over the world so we can understand different cultures, uh, we're different countries, and it makes us a much better nation ourselves if we have people represented from all over the world. No, absolutely. Uh, the beautiful melting pot uh, and so many of them coming through Ellis Island and elsewhere, um, as we talk about. Um, yeah. I wanna hear also about a little bit more of, um, of your uncle because so many people are so fascinated um, to hear about him, but also um, getting back also to your father too, and a little bit of, of the growing up period. Um, you talked about how the current events was always obviously so important in your family. Your father also was a big Shakespeare fan, correct? And, yeah. and would hear, you'd hear like, I, I was uh, grunting and Shakespeare, right? Because your bedroom was next to yeah. your parents' bedroom. Tell us about yeah. that, that's really fascinating. Yes. Yes, that's true. Well, my father very much loved Shakespeare, um, and he would, he would, um, he would. At that time, we, people had records. You know, I think if you talk to a child under probably twenty-five, they've never even heard of what a record was. But right? They say, "Yeah, what is a record?" Right? <laughs> what is a record? You keep a record of something, but they wouldn't know that there's something that goes round and round. And my father listened to Shakespeare records while he was. Um, doing his, you know, push-ups in the morning, um, and he would memorize lots of lots of Shakespeare speeches. And I think one of his one of his favorite boasts is that he um, he once had a contest with Richard Burton about who could recite some of the Shakespeare speeches. And he and, beat him, and he and won, he beat right? Him. I I don't know if that story is apocryphal, but of course I tell it. Over and my mother tells it over and over again, um, so that's it's it's funny. Anyway, he loved Shakespeare, and he could you know he would would recite it as he would recite lots of of quotes. Um, yeah. When he would go to the office, he had a quote book. It's wow. it's interesting as a parent, you know, or even a grandparent, how much you can learn, um, how much you learn from your parents. And speaking of your parents, uh, your father, Robert F. Kennedy, was very competitive in sports, too. Um, and I love the story. You do you still have the pair of skis that says, is it like KK, yeah. yes. BD, and, and talk about that. I love yes. that. Yes. He was competitive. Um, and he left. <laughs> so 
I do have a pair of skis also in this building, which I haven't, haven't gotten rid of. Shows you I also am competitive. Um, where in, and we were in, in Aspen and we were racing down a trail and I beat them and I put on the skis. KK, that's me, Kathleen Kennedy, BD, beat daddy, December 31st. 1964. So you're, I can't believe you re actually did the research to see that and that I actually tell that people that story. It really is a terrible story. I love how, it. How I love it. Well, we all were. Anyway, it's it very funny. It's but a great story. Plus, we're, and, you know, on Saturday mornings, we really did have foot touch football practice. And the and I remember the line, if you can touch it, you can catch it. That is, if you can touch the football, you better be able to catch the football. So I don't know if you've ever played touch football, but yes. you have, of course you have. But sometimes it's really hard just once you touch it to actually catch it. But that was the goal. And that was insisted that you better catch it. And also there was another sense of, of uh, com competition, which some people tell you now, you know, do your best. Have you ever heard that term? Of course, yes. Yeah. Well, my I remember I was at and this woman named Marie Ritter. Her she's probably now about ninety four, and her um, she tells me how I was at a horse show. I used to ride horses, and I would go in competitions every weekend. And she remembers um, telling me, "Oh, Kathleen, do your best." You know, I was about to go into a competition. And my father said, no, win. And I think it's really an interesting difference. And I never tell anybody to do your best. Because if you do your best, you don't know what your best is. It's just an interesting thing. And I, I so for anybody tells me, well, you've done your best. I'm always querying what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. I would rather somebody, because sometimes you don't do your best or what did, and so I think of my father's saying. And also I'm very interested about coaches. Just this is not about my father in particular, although my grandfather named my uncle Teddy after a coach. And you know that some coaches really do get their teams to win and other coaches are not as good. And I'm sure all those players under good coaches and bad coaches are thinking they're doing their best, but some coaches can bring out much stronger results than other coaches, right? So, you don't know what's inside of you. You really don't. And other people can bring out the best in you that you don't know you had. That's why I think doing your best is not really a good saying. I think the person who says that needs to know who you are and help you find what you can do. That's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You know, I think about some of the history that you got to witness also, Kathleen. And I wanna have you share this story too about your journey to Poland because you were so kind when I did uh, the book on my father. And you know, my father was a Polish resistance fighter. And I remember you telling me um, a number of years ago how much it moved you to can go just, to Poland just, with your father. Can, can I just... I have pictures of that on my wall. Can I just go get them? Sure, okay. if, it, if it's close, sure. We're here live, but go real quick. I love this. So Kathleen went to Poland. I'll tell everybody the story as she's getting the pictures. In 1964, with her father and her mother, think about that at an unbelievably historic, historic time. Okay, I and, and here's the pictures. Yay, I love this. Can you see this? We can. How beautiful. All of us watching. How beautiful. Now, I'm gonna, I have three pictures here, so I'm going to give you a story. So this is 1964. 
we asked to go to Poland. My father wanted to go to Poland and the Polish government really didn't want him to come, but they thought they couldn't deny him a visa, but they didn't tell anybody in Poland that he had arrived. They kept it totally quiet. And yet, do you see the crowds? Oh, wow. Yes. Huge wow. numbers of people come out. So clearly there's an underground in Poland that exists. Right. And by the way, just to explain to everybody, it was a communist controlled country at that time. It was a too. Yeah, communist controlled. It was under uh, under Russian domination, under the Soviet Union. Um, so fast forward. That's why Lech Walesa, who many, probably a number of your people don't know about, but he led the yeah. revolution against the Polish government, solidarity. Why Absolutely. was he able to lead that? Because there was this incredible underground and he came to Washington and these are my, this is my daughter Maeve and another daughter Megan and me, and we work with him on human rights. But the other interesting story is there was a Pope, there was a, my parents wanted to see Karol Wyszynski in Poland and my mother and father went to see him and they met a Monsignor there, who knew? And when my mother went to see Pope John the 23rd, Pope John the second, he said to her, you came to see, you came to see me in Poland and you were hungry and I made a sandwich for you. <laughs> what kind of sandwich did he make? A cheese sandwich. Oh is that my right? goodness. <laughs> this is before he was Pope. Yes, he was a Monsignor. My right. parents went to see the Cardinal because he was, in, you know, he was in Poland and he was, you know, in next, you know, he was under guard, but they, you know, they, the, Pol the Russians and the, were smart enough not to kill him. But so my parents went to visit him and, and, the, and the Monsignor who then became the Pope made my mother a sandwich. Of course, my mother didn't remember him, but my, the Pope remembered that he made my mother a sandwich. Is that How a riot? Funny. And it was a grilled cheese sandwich, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah. he remembers the kind of sandwich he made her. How funny. That, do you remember that moment meeting the Monsignor at all? Or was no, it at no, that point, he was just I a Monsignor? The Cardinal, we were little kids. As you see, I was 12 and my brothers were, you know, 11 and eight, 10. I mean, we were, we were little kids. So we stayed um, at probably at the hotel. Oh, we also went to the um, Warsaw ghetto, I remember. So at one point, you know, we were seeing what was going on in Poland and they went to, to, to see... Um, the Pope, anyway, and the Cardinal. And then the Monsignor eventually became the Pope. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you that story because- That's a great so, story. So these pictures that, and I lined up in my home, the picture from 1964, then Lequilessa and the Pope who made the cheese sandwich for my mother. <laughs> that is a great story. I'm so glad you got to share those pictures with us here on, I know, on well, the I just event. Thought, this is fantastic. Because we're doing, you know, normally when you do these kind of interviews, you're in a studio. But since I'm at home, I just thought it would be interesting to share the stories with pictures. I love that. Thank you. That's so fantastic. You know, your um, father, Robert F. Kennedy, shared all these amazing experiences, obviously taking you to Poland, as we just saw. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. Um, also, he took you to, was it a, it was a, a unveiling of a swimming pool in an inner city in Washington. And he yeah. did that because he wanted you to see firsthand um, the struggles of people in America and throughout the world. Right. Well, my father, obviously, we had quizzes at dinner, but he also believed that we should understand about how other people have challenges that we didn't have. I mean, we lived in a very nice house. We had a swimming pool and a tennis court and horses. I mean, we obviously lived a very nice life. And um, he had uh, made sure that there was a swimming pool in parts of Washington. And I remember as we drove down to Washington, there were you know, the, the, the homes and the apartments. And he said to me, 
you know, Kathleen, they're little, they're girls that are your age that lives in these apartments. And they're just like you in that sense. They have the same dreams as you do. They, they would love to, you know, grow up and go to college and have a good job and swim and play tennis and do all those things. But they don't have the opportunities you have. They don't have the, the luck that you've had. They don't have the fortune that you have. Life isn't fair, but you're, but that's, that doesn't mean that they're not just like you in other ways. And he wanted to make it clear that I would never think I'm better than somebody else just because I live in a better or nicer place. And I think that was a really, really important lesson. And he would, when we would arrive, you know, when he was the Senator from New York, we would never go straight to the Carlisle Hotel, which is where we lived at one point, or the UN Plaza, which is where we actually lived when he had an apartment there. We would go to Harlem or Bedford Stuyvesant before we would even go to the apartment. So we'd say, this is where other people live. And they have, they have struggles. And they're, so he wanted to show us that we were lucky. And I think they, I would just want to talk about that because I think that was so much that they, of what they learned from their mother, um, Rose Kennedy, because she grew up in Boston when there was such um, discrimination against the Irish, where there were, even though she was the mayor's daughter, there were the signs, help wanted, no Irish, need apply. And I'm going to just tell you what is, I think, a really, in kind of interesting 10 days in John Kennedy's life. In June of 1963, he gave a speech, which is very famous because he was the first president that said that um, civil rights was a moral issue mm -hmm. um, and said, you know, who, who, what white person would trade places with a black person? I mean, putting it in very mm -hmm. concrete terms saying, would you, because seriously, it's really tough to be black in America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not, and then he went to Berlin and he said, ich bin ein Berliner. And as you can imagine, this was 20 years after the war had ended when so many people in Europe had fought the Germans and didn't like the Germans very much because they had killed members of their family. I remember mm -hmm. I stayed at one point, I had been a exchange, uh, I took a semester off and lived in Italy. And the Italian family was furious with my uncle for saying that because they really didn't like the Germans, this particular family. Mm -hmm. And so many people across Europe didn't feel that they wanted to be a, a, a Berliner, certainly. And he was saying, we are one with Berlin. We are one with Germany. Um, and then he went to Ireland to the place where his great grandfather had left. And there was a factory there. And he said, it's just lucky that my grandfather got on the boat. It could have been your grandfather he said to the factory workers. And it could be you who are standing here and me who's still working in the factory. It's just luck that one of us isn't here and one is sitting there. And so he was really good. And I think my father shared this. That there's a lot of unfairness in life. Some of us could be standing there. Some of us could be standing here. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Not that we're better, not that we work harder. Some of us have, are just fortunate with our brains or where we're born. And so don't feel that we're a better person. We deserve what we get. And I think that's a beautiful thing that he taught. I think that my uncle taught us and my father taught us. I'll just tell you one other story about uh, the Ireland trip. Um, when he was there, he had uh, 
he did two things. He said that was the happiest four days of his life in Ireland. And Jackie wasn't with him and she learned that. So I mm-hmm. think that was mm-hmm. very nice. But he had, <laughs> he had a pair of rosary beads in his pocket, which he carried with him. And when he died um, in Dallas, uh, it, he had rosary beads in Dallas and she sent them back to where his family came in Ireland and they were put in a museum there because she oh, knew beautiful. that it was very beautiful. So there's a sense of you remember your roots, you remember what's important. You're not self-righteous about who you, who you are. You have heart for those who are um, who suffer. Very beautiful. Um, you know, I think about also your uncle's inauguration speech. And of course, here at the Global Service Institute, and we have people listening from all over the world, watching from all over the world now, Kathleen. And one of the greatest speeches, I think, ever epitomizing service is that inauguration speech of your uncle, John F. Kennedy, when he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Yes, he did say that. And the idea is that, you know, this is all not, this whole life is not just about me, but what we can contribute to make our community better. Because when the community is better, when our country is better, we are better off. And he said the same thing to the citizens of the world. What can our, what can we contribute as citizens of the world to make a better peaceful world in which everyone can flourish. And I think that's the question that we have to keep asking each other. And it's tough, but in the era of so much more interconnected trade, in the era of climate change, in an era in which there's 60 million refugees, we really do have to ask those questions with the people that are listening from all over the world and open our hearts and our minds to how we're gonna solve these international and interconnected problems. And not just look at life as it was. Now, one of the things that John Kennedy did, which is quite stunning and really shocked a lot of people when he did it, he said that Algeria should be free and get and get rid of the French in, in and nobody could believe he did this, least of all right. the French, right. because they were a colonial power. And Europe was mostly a colonial power. And they thought we should control the world. Europe, we have the wisdom of the world. And John Kennedy he said, no, people should be free. Hmm. And when Algeria was free. The first African president, Algerian president, came to the White House. And I don't know about New York, but there are a number of Algerians who now live in Washington. And they oh, yeah. they say to me when they know who I am, John Kennedy, there's a John Kennedy Boulevard in Algiers, Algeria. And they remember. They because it was so stunning that this senator from Massachusetts, like who was he that understood the need for freedom? That had the courage, you know. And, and had the to... courage. Like who was he? It was so mm-hmm. contradictory. And I think that's what he, the idea of travel, the idea of learning from other people, the idea that these people who are, look different, live in a different place, deserve, to be recognized, even though they come from a different place, is so important. And I'm so that's what I love about your show. It's not we have people from all over the world watching. Absolutely, it's beautiful. You know, um, soon after your uncle was assassinated, and one of the most obviously terrible days in the world, November 1963. Your father left a really powerful note for you. And I I want you to talk about that because it it talked about that sense of responsibility and giving back. 
Well, what's amazing is that um, my father wrote me a note and said, dear Kathleen, if this is on White House stationery, and he said, dear Kathleen, you seem to understand that Jack died and was buried today. As the oldest of the Kennedy grandchildren, you have a special responsibility. Uh, be kind to others, a special responsibility to your family. Uh, be kind to others, work for your country, love daddy. And I think about that, that note of the words, first of all, the fact that he wrote it. Second of all, that there's no sense in that letter of bitterness or anger or desire for revenge. So, which you could, I mean, I, I worked in the criminal justice system mm -hmm. a lot. And I saw a lot of people when something terrible happened, I wanna get that guy. And they live their rest of their life with bitterness and anger and a desire for revenge, which destroys them and eats them up. And he made sure that his children and the country to the best he could did not live with that. I, I think of, you know, Bill Clinton's don't stop, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. He wanted us to move on because he knew it was better for me as a family, better for my brothers and sisters and better for the country. And then he talked about my responsibility to my family, the importance of kindness, mm -hmm. serving my country, just as John Kennedy had asked us to do, that you where do you find, you know, a lot of people talk about how important it is to find purpose in your life, that that's really what you need. And he was saying, find purpose, find purpose in helping your family and serving your country and in love, you know, because he signs it love. And I think that's a, if you think about a guiding way of living life, he certainly, he gave it to me in that letter and how blessed and lucky I am. For sure. And thank and you I'm for lucky, sharing that. And I'm lucky to share it with you because everybody suffers pain. Everybody suffers loss. It's the human condition. So the question always is, how do you respond to your loss? I, as you know, Friday is the anniversary of the loss of my daughter and my grandson. And she was just the light of our family and he was terrific, great athlete. And I watched my son-in-law who gives and gives and gives and, and, and I see what we have to do to continue to lift up that family and continue to lift up what she cared about, which is global health with memories of her and helping one another. And uh, your daughter yeah. and grandson are amazing too, Kathleen. I know there's some fellowships in her honor. Yes. And how beautiful that you're sharing her incredible yeah. life with all of us. Yeah, and that's what and that's what you do. And if you if you if you live in bitterness and pain, if you live in bitterness, it's it only hurts you and it hurts the people around you. The, what a beautiful, and I know there's so many beautiful tributes to her um, and to Gideon too, uh, and the garden, Gideon's garden and yeah, there's some Gideon's, other wonderful, how great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's Gideon's garden and then there's also um, a, a fund that's been set up in the school where May was the PTA president and help people who have suffered from COVID and there's fellowships uh, for international fellowships that have been set up so that, um, the work that she did in international health will continue. That's really beautiful, really beautiful. And, and obviously anything we can do on the Global Service Institute to help shine a light, we would be honored to do. Um, I think about all the great things that your family have done, um, Kathleen, and, and obviously you instilled those beautiful values in, in Maeve and Gideon too. And your, your family's amazing when I think about everything you've done. I mean, even before you became Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, 
you were so committed to making sure that service was a part in young people. And you obviously passed that on to your daughter and your grandson too, and so many others. Um, you were also involved in the Points of Light and uh, the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, the Jefferson Awards. This is something so much in, in your core. Um, and your uncle also helped sort of lead the path for the Peace Corps. Uh, I mean, we think about uh, some of the greatest service institutions in this country, and clearly it's something you've passed on to, in your family too. It's so important, right? It's such an important part of your soul. Yes, it is. And just to say, and my Aunt Eunice, as you know, started the Special Olympics. Of course, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and my Aunt Jane started very special art. So there's a lot going on. Um, I think that, but I was, as we, we talked ahead of time, when John Kennedy was asked, why does he want to be president? He said, because that's where the action is. <laughs> and, and I want to emphasize that, which I did, um, because service is really, it's a way of also feeling of a sense of power that you can do something, that you can make a difference, that you, you're not useless or hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there are studies actually, you know, there are different types of service. Um, there's direct service, I look into your eyes and I help you. There's indirect service, I raise money for a fund. Um, and there's advocacy, you know, I get a law passed. It's interesting, and there's people like different types of service. You, we, when I was getting kids involved in service, we would do queries. What do you like the best? But we found uh, that the direct service, if you do it well, and you do look into people's eyes, it's kind of like you get the same thrill for some as making love, literally. I won't go into the exact <laughs> what you say, but it can really, <laughs> it can be a real turn on is the point. <laughs> I'm never going to look at service the same way again. You know that. <laughs> As John Kennedy said, that's where the action is. <laughs> so I want you to understand, I want to, to say that because It's important to, to know that it's really can be uplifting. We did, um, when we required service in Maryland, we required what is called preparation. You have to think about why you're doing service or why you're cleaning up a stream or why you're going into a senior citizen home or whatever, uh, why you're tutoring. And then afterwards, we required reflection. Uh, what did you learn? What did you think about? Was it difficult? And at one point, um, we did a, I used to do conferences, as you can imagine. And we required uh, people to read from their reflections. And we had special ed kids read from their reflections and honor society kids talk about their service. The Honor Society kids were not required to do preparation, action, and reflection. They were just told to do their 10 hours of service. That was the deal. But the special ed kids, because they were part of our program, had to do the preparation, action, and reflection. And it was fascinating. The special ed kids did a much better job of explaining what they had gotten out of service than the Honor Society kids. Because if you think about it, and you reflect upon it, you get more out of it. And we also learned that when you are teaching kids to write, it's often the case that kids who have done service with preparation, action, and reflection are much better writers because they have something to write about and they want to tell their story because they're proud of what they have done versus kids who live in situations in which they don't want to write about anything they've seen or done. Really powerful. So, so 
I wanted to make service a requirement in Maryland rather than in other states, it's not a requirement because people in the other places said, oh, we should just make it work for people who want to do service. And I said, if you do it that way, I'll tell you who will do service. People who want to go to college and they know it will look good on their resume or people who are lucky enough to come from a family like mine who are told by their parents it's a good idea or people who are lucky enough to have a teacher who gets them excited. And you'll, you'll miss out of all the kids who haven't had that who don't think of they're going to college or don't have a good teacher or don't come from a family. I want every kid to have the feeling of making love or being where the action is. Really beautiful. And you're absolutely right because it's so important that everybody gets those opportunities and is able to pass it on and has access to it. I think by yeah. making it accessible to everybody, that is the key. That it's absolutely beautiful. And um, we have a lot of questions, by the way, that came in um, okay. from folks all over the world. And I wanna okay. um, ask them to you um, and just ask you a few uh, quick ones. One of them actually um, from Jennings in Australia asked, um, tell the story real quickly, if you could, about your uncle and his heroism in World War II because he was a, a war hero even before he got into politics. He was well, also- and, a, and, and, Well, of course the person from Australia should ask that question because he was saved from a, by a person from Australia. I know, <laughs> that's I'm sure why there's a connection. <laughs> I, was, I knew you were- Well, as, a, as, as John Kennedy, when he said, are you a hero? He said, no, they struck my boat. But he was, his boat, his PT-109 was struck by a Japanese destroyer and um, so three, I think it was three people were killed, but he took the others. He, they had life jackets on and he swam for about nine hours in the Pacific till they landed on an island. He wrote on a coconut, we're on this island. He threw it into the sea. Wow. And um, luckily enough, I think uh, it was discovered and an Australian, I think it was, in the, it was from Australia who discovered it, I think, the coconut and sent a boat to rescue them. That's the quick way of seeing it. I might've gotten some of the facts wrong, but the point is he was totally heroic and he did win the Navy cross for, for this. And uh, so thank you. And they, uh, a movie was made out of it and he was, and a book was made out of this as well. So he was a hero going into wow. when he uh, ran for president. So thank you and thank you, Australia. And I no, went no. to Australia a few years ago, and I love your wonderful country. You're, it's a beautiful country, great outback, and great cities. Yeah, great. How beautiful. Great. Now, um, now, here's another one from Richard Bear. I don't know where Richard's from, but he says, I am pretty sure your father would have defeated Nixon in 1968 and become the 37th president. I believe he would have had a calming effect on the country as his brother did. Do you agree? Yeah, of course I agree. I don't think we would have had the um, Chicago riots. Mm -hmm. And I think been, um, and he, I think it would have been much better. Uh, the life, our world would have been much better. I am not a believer in that. I believe that when people, some people die, the world is much worse. And I think my father's de death was certainly harmful for our, our family and awful for our country and the world. Yeah, sure. I think about as someone who loves history and loves this country, boy, it would have been so great to have seen your father at the helm of this country. It, it yeah, I mean, been... I mean, Humphrey lost by so little, mm -hmm. and um, then my father would have won. Um, also, by the way, Richard asks, how is your mother, who is, what, 92 years young? Is that right? She's 93, and she's about wow. to be um, 94 on April 11th. Oh, so, my goodness. So it's pretty exciting, very exciting. How is she doing? Is she doing she's great? Doing great. She's, live, she's up in uh, Massachusetts. She stayed there all winter um, because of COVID and it's, it was safer to be in Massachusetts than go to Florida, as she used to do. And uh, she's got a great sense of humor. She's just totally funny and to hang out with her is right. During COVID, now she has, she's had her two shots, but during COVID, 
we put, my brother Christopher was very smart, put a um, screen up so you could eat with her. She was on one side of the table, there was a screen and you were on the other side and you could talk to her over the microphone. And then because her favorite game is backgammon, which he wins all the time, there was a screen and there was a glove and you could play backgammon with her through the glove. Now, does she still um, watch Do you Jim understand Kelly? how funny it is that you could play backgammon with my mother with a glove? Oh my I mean, God. There's, but, you know, well, no, does she still you, watch Gene Kelly? That's my question too. Oh yeah, she always, of course she watches Gene Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? Of course. Um, by the way, I'm gonna throw one more question to you. Um, this is from Tahir, who is all the way in uh, Pakistan. I love this, that they're all glued in all over the world watching this. I'm asking you, are you ever eyeing a White House race yourself at any point in your career? I think there's a lot of people who want you to run for president at some point, by the way. <laughs> and that's, as you know, I was Lieutenant Governor and I love politics. I think it is an honorable profession as John Buck and Lord Tweedsmeyer said, but uh, there are other members of my family who I hope get involved in politics and uh, there are other things for me to do. Thank you very much. Oh, but well, what a this perfect talk about Pakistan. My, my classmate in college was a Benazir Bhutto, and she did run and she was killed in Pakistan. I thought that was a great loss for Pakistan and a loss for me, who she was a wonderful human being. Yeah, and I had I had the honor of knowing Benazir as well, and what an incredible hero. And to see her also to see a woman leader too uh, in the world. I yeah. mean, I, I think it's so important to see that more women. Um, running in those key positions too. She was such a such a, an amazing, amazing woman. Do you think yeah. we'll see other Kennedys in the future as you talked about? I would think so. <laughs> it's a big family. It is, it is. And Kathleen, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us. This was such an incredible honor to have you here and to get your perspectives about your incredible father, your incredible uncle, and your incredible life and legacy. Um, you and your family have done so much, I think, for service, I think more than any other family that I can think about in America. And to also just share these beautiful personal stories that you, know, you experienced firsthand in your journeys throughout the world. It means so much. And, and thank you on behalf of the Global Service Institute for being here and sharing your family and your life with all of us. It really means so much. Well, Rita, it's been great to be with you and congratulations for all your great work and for celebrating service. It's terrific. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Best. And oh, you too. And such an honor to have you here. And everybody, please also make sure that you check out our website, globalserviceinstitute.org. You just heard from the incredible Kathleen Kennedy. We have more speakers coming up and so many great programs and so many great ways for you to get involved. I hope you were as inspired as I'm sure I was uh, just talking with Kathleen and hearing these great stories and, and just, I feel so motivated and so moved. So everybody, you. please check out globalserviceinstitute.org. Kathleen, thank you. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you. And thank you all of you for watching.